Thank you. And note that the last phrase is the key phrase, that thy name be glorified. It has nothing to do with us. It has to do with him and glorifying him. Now, if you would bow with me in prayer, please. Father, we thank you for this day. And we thank you that you are the giver of all that we have. Every good gift and every perfect gift descends from the Father of lights. Thank you, Father. And as we hear again from your word, and from the lips of the living word, your son Jesus. May we be followers of him. And may we live up to our name of Christians, the anointed ones. Thank you, Father, for the blessing that is already on your word. I pray, Father, that you would anoint me to preach those who listen to hear and that your word would go forth with authority in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 61. I guess I'm going to take my glasses off because I can see better without them from the distance I'm reading at. We're also going to be looking into the book of Luke chapter 4 and I will have a couple of other references that will be added in from time to time. Isaiah 61 verses 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison doors to those who are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. Turn with me to Luke chapter 4, and we read of the same passage this time as the Lord Jesus read it, and it's a little bit abbreviated because he's quoting from the Septuagint version, whereas the Old Testament that we have is mostly from the Masoretic version. Luke chapter 4, beginning with verse 18, down through verse 21. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of Jehovah. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And I want to repeat that. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing and in my ear. Because as I pray, we are the anointed ones. God has anointed us. You read these passages, and I know specifically 
The one in Isaiah is looking forward to the Lord Jesus. Jesus reads from that passage, applies it to his own ministry, and yet, who is the body of Christ on earth today? We are. We are. And so who has God anointed to carry out this ministry? Jesus said in another place that the works that I do, you shall do and greater. Let that sink in for a moment. The works that he did, we will do and greater. To begin with, they will be greater in number. He was one person, we are many, and his body now covers the whole face of the earth. In the first century, it was limited to one place at a time in the land of Palestine, Israel. But his body now has expanded to cover the whole earth. Remember the parable that he told of the mustard seed? and the mustard plant, how it begins as a tiny little seed, and then it grows into a great tree or a great bush. Started as one seed, the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ means anointed. And it turned into Christians, a huge tree that covers the face of the earth. We are you are, I am, the anointed ones. I asked the pastor if we could sing the previous song. And as I said, it has nothing to do with being of a denomination or other. It has everything to do with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit on us. And it covers all denominations. And it has to do with us, ultimately, the same end that we read in the passage in Isaiah 61, that his name be glorified. We are empowered for that purpose. So I am anointed, and you are anointed. We are anointed together to carry the good news, to heal the brokenhearted. Has anybody here ever had to sit down with somebody who is broken hearted and needed a hug or an arm around their shoulder to let them cry on your shoulder. Jesus is not here physically to do that, but we are. We are carrying out his message. Now the Apostle Paul said, Be not drunk with wine, and, and I'm switching back and forth between New King James and King James this morning. You'll forgive me for that. He said, be not drunk with wine, which is to excess, or uh, let's see, a couple of the other versions say dissipation, unsavedness, and debauchery. I never realized that the excess meant unsavedness. If you're getting drunk with wine, the opinion of the Apostle is that you're on the borderline of being unsaved. It's not becoming. He didn't say don't drink wine. He said not to excess. The alternative is to be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and uh, spiritual songs and making melody in your heart. The idea, and you've heard me say this before in other sermons, the idea is that we are to be as moved by the Holy Spirit to do things that we wouldn't normally do to tear down our inhibitions as we would if, as if we were intoxicated. I, I hope most of you have not been intoxicated. In my younger years, before I committed my life to Christ, I was a drinker. I wasn't an alcoholic by any stretch of the imagination, but when I went out for a party, I drank with one purpose in mind, and that was to get drunk, to get high so I could 
loosen up. And uh, much to my wife's chagrin, I did. But now my desire, since I have been transformed, remember Jesus prayed for Peter. He said, when you have been tra excuse me, transformed or when you have been converted, King James says, that he would be a leader amongst his brethren. And I'm paraphrasing here. But my desire now is that I be so filled with the Spirit that He can empower me to do things that I would not naturally do. When somebody speaks to me and asks me a question about Scripture, and I shared with you experience we had a couple of weeks ago, my wife and I together, and God gave me the words to say to this young man. It was not my doing. It was the doing of the Holy Spirit. I always want to be ready. And I thank God that just so happened. Just so happened. Just so happened. It was pure coincidence, I'm sure that I had been studying all of those things because we had just gone through the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and it was all fresh and clear in my mind and I had taught it at the nursing home and I had taught it in the Bible study. So it was clear in my mind and I was able to clearly tell him and answer his question, what does Good Friday mean? Now this is Mother's Day, and uh, happy Mother's Day to all you ladies. You guys will get your chance later on, not to be mothers, that is, but Father's Day. But I want to relate to you a story about my own mother. And uh, my mother was the more exuberant of my two parents. Uh, most of you know that my dad was a Baptist preacher and my mother was the mother of seven children and they had been missionaries and so forth together. But my mother was a lady who always had a smile on her face in spite of the circumstances and she went through some pretty tough circumstances in her Christian life. They went to Africa to serve and they ended up being there for only four years because my father came ill with a nervous breakdown. And I was there, but I don't remember, because I was only nine months old when we got back to the States, even though I was born over there. But my folks told me that they slept in separate cabins. My dad slept separate from the family because they were so afraid of what he might do. He was both suicidal and he was so out of it, can I put it that way, that they were afraid that he might do damage to one of the children especially. And perhaps even me, because I, I might have been a symbol of all that he was loathing at the moment, I don't know. But I say all of that so you know that my mother went through great difficulties. And by the way, in those days in Africa, uh, the running water came on the shoulders of one of the natives in a bucket. And their toilet was outside of the house. There was no air conditioning, there was no heat, they probably didn't need heat. Um, and snakes were a common thing and people keep warning me about the snakes in Tennessee. But I'm sure they don't have any 26 foot long pythons in Tennessee like they had in Africa. My mom and dad had the opportunity to go and see Handel's Messiah or hear Handel's Messiah being sung at the local congregational church in our hometown. And uh, as it worked out, they were sitting up in the balcony. And you know as Messiah comes to the end and especially the Hallelujah Chorus it comes to a great crescendo at the end. And as it came to an end, my mother jumped out of her seat 
And she yelled, Hallelujah! Hallelujah! And my dad sitting there grabbed her, the, her skirt and pulled her down and said, What are you doing, woman? That's the difference between my mom and dad. My mom was not afraid to be motivated by the Holy Spirit, even allowing her emotions to be motivated by the Holy Spirit. And she had a great outreach. She was a pastor's wife, not the preacher. But I think she actually was uh, instrumental in the winning of more souls over the years than my dad was. That's not saying my dad didn't preach the gospel. He did. Well, one of the last people that were saved during my dad's ministry when he was in his 80s and he was filling in at a church as an interim pastor. My mother was in the habit of giving the children's story. They didn't have Sunday school per se. But she would give a children's story before the sermon. And in those days, it wasn't PowerPoint. It was flannel graphs. Or it was board, card boards, you know, storyboards. And she gave one of those children's stories, and I don't know which one it was now. She gave one of those children's stories on a sunny morning, and after the service, an 89-year-old man came to my dad and asked to be baptized. He had sat in church all of his life and he said, I never understood the gospel until your wife told that story. And he had been a church for all of his life. That's just one story. I miss my mom and dad. They've both been gone since 2001. So that's 18 years ago. It will be 18 years at the end of this year. And they were an inspiration to me, as well as a challenge to me. I preached at my mother and my dad's memorial services. And the day after my dad died and I preached at his memorial service, I preached the morning service at our hometown church. As difficult as that was today, seems to be, <coughs> excuse me, seems to be more difficult for me. While we've only known each other for six plus years, my wife and I have come to love you and appreciate you and get to know you on a personal basis. And one of the hardest parts for us moving is the leaving behind of friends and family. Jesus said, he who forsakes his family and follows me will gain many, many more mothers, fathers, sisters, brothers, children. And indeed that is true. I have found that to be true in our life since we committed our lives to Christ. And as we continue to do that, when we left home the first time to go to Pennsylvania to pioneer a church down there, our families couldn't understand it. My mom and dad couldn't understand it. My wife's mom and dad couldn't understand it. Our children didn't understand it, but we all went anyway. And it wasn't any easier for the next move to a different part of Pennsylvania. Each time we gained new family members and new friends. But what remains constant for me and my desire 
and my desire for you as my brothers and sisters and my mothers and fathers is that we all walk in the anointing of the Holy Spirit and that we recognize not only our responsibility but our great privilege. It is an awesome privilege for us to be used by our Heavenly Father to carry His message wherever we go. And what is the one thing that we're going to be asked when we stand before the throne of Christ? What have you done? Some of us will receive rewards, rewards of gold and silver, precious metals, jewels. Others, our works will be burned up like fire because there will be wood, hay, and stubble. The final goal and the final blessing that I look for is that the Lord will say to me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And that is my desire for you as well as for myself. We're going to be partaking communion together. And communion is not just vertical between us and God. It is also horizontal between us together. That we are forgiven from one another and have forgiven one another. So that when we stand before God here at the altar, and we partake of the body and the blood of Jesus, we can with clear conscience say, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me this day for my trespasses as I have forgiven those who have trespassed against me. We are one. Let's bow together. Father, I pray that you would touch us one more time. We celebrate Pentecost, that 50th day after your crucifixion, Lord Jesus, resurrection. But we note as we read in the book of Acts that even several days later, you poured out your spirit again and the people were moved and they gave glory to your name. May it be said of us, that we are people who are moved by your Holy Spirit. No matter how big or how small our church fellowship is, our focus is to glorify your name, Jehovah God. In the name of your Son, Jesus, I pray. Amen.